journalism without fear or favor in this day and, and age It must be the commitment of us all to contribute to a free, pluralistic, and independent media environment. This is why we are here to interrogate, to look at the World Press Freedom Day. And we're talking about a free and independent media that is particularly necessary during a calamity such as the COVID-19 health crisis bedeviling nations of the world. Our media must therefore not be wanting, and they have not been, in our national response to the devil in town, for this is one challenge during which we cannot afford a single conscientious objector. Today is world Press Freedom Day, three decades ago, nations of the world converged on Winduk, Namibia, and after some soul-searching deliberations, the conference resolved to adopt the Winduk Declaration for the development of a free, independent, and pluralistic press. This historic decision was taken in 1991, as I said, here in Vinduk. Therefore, we gather here today to unpack the theme, World Press Freedom Day, journalism without fear or favor. We shall also interrogate why independent, uh, independent media matters. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, Namibia. And welcome to the COVID-19 Communications Center. My name is Bob Kandetu, and I shall for this morning be your host, be your driver. Joining me in the studio is our sign language interpreter, Selma Moses. I am pleased to present to you a panel of eminent persons who will unpack the subject matter. And these are Honorable Dr. Pea Mushelenga, Minister of Information and Communication Technology. Most welcome, Minister. Thank you very much. Good morning, Bob. Good morning, viewers. Gwen Lister, Chairperson of the Namibia Media Trust, founder of the, Namibia, of the Namibian newspaper that was long ago during the years of our upheaval and co-chairperson of the Winduk Declaration Conference in 1991. She is one of the people we shall have to rely on this morning when we are to interrogate the, the long term of this, uh, of this uh, declaration. And lastly here, Mr. John Nakuta, media ombudsman and human rights lecturer at UNAM. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you very much also for the organizers. <coughs> Excuse I, realize, I realize I said lastly, but we have, <laughs> I'm sure my friend uh, Stefan thought I'm, I cut him out. Lastly, we have uh, Mr. Frank Stefan, chairperson of the Namibia Editors Forum, um, here with us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, and most welcome to be here today with us. We shall also be joined by, Guy, by Mr. Guy Berger, Secretary for the International Program for the Development of Communication. He is at UNESCO, based in Paris, France. Hi, Guy. Can you see me? Yes, I can. Good morning. Most welcome, Guy. And, um, I'm very happy you are with us today. Along with our radio, television, and online audiences, we are joined by editors and senior journalists of Namibia's media houses, and we shall invite them to, as usual, participate. Once more, welcome all, and thank you for joining us. 
as if, incidentally, I want to belabor this. The Windhoek Declaration of 1991 set the stage for the United Nations Organization to proclaim World Press Freedom Day in 1993, and ever since UNESCO had, had spearheaded celebrations of this day. Before we dive uh, into the discussions, let us welcome Guy Berger on Skype, as I said, from Paris, France. He will give us a brief orientation to the day. And this is over to you, Guy. We are in your hands, please. Well, excellent. Thank you, and congratulations for having this event on this historic day. Uh, as you said, uh, indeed, this is a day that owes its origins to uh, this conference in Windhoek that uh, UNESCO put together, 1991. And indeed, today, uh, more than 100 countries ar around the world are marking this day with different kinds of events, of course, mainly online now. But I would uh, suggest that probably Vintuk and Namibia are, are known internationally as the cradle of this international day. Before uh, this conference, which was one year after your independence, uh, there was no such day in the UN system. So congratulations to Namibia. And I'm pleased also that next year, 2021, which is the 30th anniversary of this conference, that uh, indeed UNESCO will have its global conference in partnership with uh, the Namibian government, uh, Namibian media, Namibian civil society, academia, and so on. So next year, uh, 3rd of May, uh, UNESCO will help to bring more attention and more participation in this day by coming to uh, Vintuk, and we'll have a, a very important focus then, probably also taking stock of what has been the case of the press during these very, very challenging times. I also want to just alert you that um, the UN you know, is now taking this day very, very seriously uh, because of these times. And tomorrow, that's Monday at 5 p.m., you will have a, a dialogue online uh, on the UNESCO Facebook site. So that is facebook.com slash UNESCO at 5 p.m. tomorrow. And this will have the head of the UN, uh, Antonio Guterres. It will have the head of UNESCO, who I work for, uh, Madame Azoulay, Audrey Azoulay, and then the head of the UN Human Rights Council, uh, Michelle Bachelet, Madame Michelle Bachelet. So these three top people in the UN are going to be speaking tomorrow about press freedom. Uh, why is this? It's an unprecedented uh, attention to this issue by the heads of the, the key UN agencies. And it's because of, of this day that began with yourselves. Now, if I could just say a, a quick remark about the theme, journalism without fear or favor. So this is a call to the journalists that they should work without fear or favor, uh, very professionally, public interest, uh, facts, uh, not opinions. Uh, when they host discussions, they need to be balanced. They need to have evidence-based discussions. But it's also a call on governments, and governments should not try and capture the media or, or, or distort the media. Uh, indeed, in Namibia, there was a, a, an unfortunate experience at one point where uh, the government was boycotting one newspaper with, with, with advertising. And this is really not uh, something to be recommended. You know, government advertising, especially health advertising like now, you cannot uh, deprive the, the public by only going to some media that you like and not going to other media. And this is also important because it's about credibility. You know, the, the danger uh, very often in Africa, but in other countries also, is that the media is so controlled by the government, especially state-owned media. And then it doesn't have the, the, the credibility that's needed today when you need to produce messages the public can trust. You need to produce messages that are are authentic, where people have confidence. And if a, a media house is just uh, going to be a mouthpiece for the government, people think, well, OK, of course, the government is saying this, but it's not strong enough uh, for their message to be carried. And of course, the governments themselves, we, we need them to be transparent, to, to release information as much as possible, not hide things, uh, to be very also um, 
open about who's, who uh, is benefiting from government uh, money, food packages, uh, because unfortunately, despite these times, you find still some corruption continues and so on. And so media is really important, independent media. And the journalists and their supporters and the government need to recognize independent media is the way to go. We cannot mask the truth at this point in time. Uh, at UNESCO, with this World Press Freedom Day, we have a slogan which says, just like food, facts are essential. Because without facts, we don't know what to do. And there's a lot of nonsense out there, unfortunately, especially on the social media. We at UNESCO, we call it the disinfodemic. And this disinfodemic, it's seen terrible things happen. In, in one country, uh, I'll name the country, in Iran, more than 700 people have died from drinking false cures. In other countries, people are being incited to violence under rumor and gossip. Uh, so we really need the facts. And for that, you need good journalism and you need free journalism and independent journalism. So it's really important. And I must here con commend Namibia because I think as a result of your media, you, the public opinion, the people, the government, you have jumped early on this issue. You have not uh, fallen into the mistake that happened in Europe, uh, in, in the UK and, and in the USA. They just waited, waited, waited. And then it was, uh, the problem hit them uh, and they were not uh, fully prepared. And uh, here where I am living in France, well, I can tell you, I see and hear every day about the, the life and death issues. This is a terrible thing, a lockdown, but I tell you, it's better to be locked down uh, even if uh, you know, you're under very, very tight conditions, uh, poor, hungry, but better be that than dead, because that is the, 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 the very difficult trade-off. Now, media has a role to play to help us overcome this period, to help ensure that people know what to do, where to go for support. And this depends on the credibility of the media, it depends on the free and independent media. So I, I think for those introductory remarks, I, I just once again commend the Namibia for your, uh, your strong media, for respecting media freedom, media independence. The journalists you have, count yourselves lucky because in many countries they are not so blessed. Many countries have problems much, much worse. And yet Namibia, you, know, you, you have a chance to come through this with less damage than some other countries are experiencing. So thank you very much, and I wish you a very good uh, debate on behalf of UNESCO. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Guy, for that uh, illuminating broad orientation of where we came from and where we possibly should be. I picked a few of your, of your, of your remarks there. I, I am told, unfortunately, Guy will not stay with us because he has to, to take off to another assignment. And uh, thank you very, very much for being with us, Guy, and I wish you the very best. Thank you, and all the best for your discussion, all the best for Namibia. Uh, stay safe, uh, stay uh, uh, with good information in your, in your system, and uh, we will all pull through this. So uh, next year, when uh, UNESCO comes to Namibia for World Press Green Day, we will celebrate the role of your media, the role of your public uh, in, in getting through this. And if anybody's interested, as I said, tomorrow, 5 p.m., uh, facebook.com slash UNESCO, hear what the heads of the UN are, are saying about this important question. Press freedom, independence of journalism, and the COVID crisis. Thank you, and, and goodbye. Thank you so much. A guy from Paris, France, he just left us. Gwen, let me, let me pick with you to break the ice. You are the midwife the founding parent for this exercise that brings us to Vinuk yet. And I'm told that in 2022, I believe, there shall be again an international conference in this place. Take us through, if you can, picking from where Guy left off. Uh, give us a bit further orientation. What did you people have in mind with this exercise? Thank you very much, Bob. And before I'd, I answer your question, may I just wish all journalists a very happy World Press Freedom Day. Uh, for those journalists who are lucky enough to be free and out and about reporting, let us spare a thought for the hundreds of journalists uh, around the world who are missing, who are detained, and many who have been killed in the exercise of their work. 
um, I think it's important to remember that this day is about journalists. And because we're in the midst of a COVID pandemic, I cannot say to you all, go out and hug a journalist today, but I think we need to remember on this day, as we do on, on Workers' Day, we think of our workers. On Women's Day, we think of our women. So this is not a day that we should be going out to trash journalists. I think it happens most of the time that people shoot the messenger, but this is the day they must give them a break, I think. So thank you, Bob. The Vintuk Declaration, um, which was adopted in 1991, and I had the privilege of being there for that, uh, is a huge occasion, especially for Africa. Um, it was a time when African journalists from across the continent got together. They were coming out of an era of government domination of media on the continent, and they basically put their foot down and they adopted the Vintuk Declaration, which in its essence calls for the promotion uh, and maintenance of an independent pluralistic press on the African continent. And this, uh, I think, in a way, really opened up um, independent media, not only in Africa, but also to the world. And it's because of that declaration that the UN adopted this day um, as World Press Freedom Day. The exciting thing, as you mentioned and Guy also mentioned, is that next year, 2021, the Vintuk Declaration turns 30 years old. And what better place to celebrate that than in the country where it was born, in Vintuk, Namibia. And so we look forward, as I say, Namibia has pride of place in the adoption of this declaration. So we look forward to that happening here next year. Thank you very much, Gwen. Minister, the, I, I recall Guy closed his, uh, his uh, remarks by saying independent media is the way to go. Having worked with media, when he said that, I looked around and I saw all the media practitioners looking at you. Why is freedom of expression such a critical element in democratic uh, the discourse in, in, in any society? And Talk to us, if you can, what, what is the freedom of expression, what is independent media as opposed to what media and all this? Thank you very much, Bob. Yeah, freedom of expression is one of the pillars of the democracy. It is enshrined in our constitution, which has been hailed as one of the uh, examples of democracy and they were one of the, the uh, constitutions praised worldwide. Uh, that is because people are able to express how they feel about a number of things uh, without being controlled, without being intimidated. And in this setup of freedom of expression, we get to learn what are the views of the public? What are the views of the government? Now, why it is important and what does it really mean? You see, as you have listened to Guy, he has been talking about without fear or favor. So there are two sides to the coin. One, this freedom should be expressed without fear, without any control. Now, this freedom should be expressed without favor. I would add also without prejudice. Meaning, when you express your freedom, you should not favor one entity over the other. You must be fair. And your expression should not prejudice another entity. That now boils down to the five basic principles of uh, five basic ethical principles of journalism. That is being our truth and accuracy, that whatever you are writing, you should check that it must be factual. We know one cannot always be 100% factual, but if you have then not presented correct facts, it should not be intentional, and you should be able to correct that. Secondly, 
a question of impartiality and fairness. In your reporting, you shouldn't be partial. We know journalists are human beings and they have their preferences. And as a journalist, you must not let yourself to be compromised by your partiality when you are presenting your facts. Then the question of independence now. Independence from whom? It does not only mean independence from government control, for example. Independence from any control from any interest group. That is what it means. Then the question of humanity. Whether what we are saying is causing to harm to other people. That is also important to guard against that. Then another point now is accountability. You must account for what you are saying. And you should be able to say here, I have done a mistake and I should be able to rectify in a manner that I restore the dignity of the person to whom my reporting has caused harm. Thank you. When I see you opening your mouth, you, you, want, to, you want to... Sorry, no. Um, yeah, I agree in principle with everything that's been said. Um, but I think it's more complicated than, than the minister lays things out. The question of independent journalism, for example, means journalism that is without strict government or any kind of corporate, as the minister said, other types of, of controls. So the issue is not that government don't control media, because they do, especially on our continent. So do political parties, so do vast corporate interests. The issue, bring it back to the Vintuk Declaration, is the issue of plurali pru plurality, which is fine, but then there must not be interference in independent editorial policy. I think this is the main issue that underpins it. So the minister says media mustn't be uh, partial. Well, if you've got a, a, um, a political party-run newspaper, it's clearly going to be partial towards the political party in question. The issue is really that readers and viewers out there should have choices of the kind of mediums they read or they watch. And I think that's where it comes to. If they choose to watch party propaganda, they may make that choice. If they want independent news, uh, they can do that as well. As long as there's a diversity of news media, I think this is critical. You, you seem to implicitly contest the minister's assertion that media must be free from control by, by anybody other than just the state. The minister seemed to say that not only from the state, but also from corporate. Yes, um, as I say, I would prefer that media is independent, okay. um, but obviously somebody's got to own the media at some point. Um, in my own case, we have media which is owned by a trust, so it's not owned by corporate or government or other uh, special interests. But the main thing is who, whoever does own the media must ensure that there's editorial independence and that journalists are allowed in whatever those mediums are to report without fear or favor. Thank you. Frank, um, Media Freedom Globally, where do you fit Namibia? How, do, how, how would you rate the media environment in Namibia um, against the backdrop of the, uh, the latest uh, Press Freedom Index? Yeah, this is where I wanted to come in just now already. I, I strongly feel I agree with uh, Gwen. Uh, it's about choice. And the same applies internationally and locally. At the end of the day, it's the reader who decides who's right and who's not. So within the democratic context, I just feel that experiences, views, ideas, and these, uh, all types of news need to be exchanged. And it's through that exchange that at the end of the day, you start bettering society, get, it, get a better understanding and a better respect for each other. And it is only once you've done that, that you can automatically pass the cue to the politician, because at the end of the day, the politician should react to what the majority of the country thinks and believes in. And it is from there that they start creating their policy. So independence is obviously very important. I, I truly believe it, uh, even if it is a political paper, as Gwen said. At the end of the day, you decide where you belong. But it is the reader who decides whether he supports you in that view. So in, invariably, you will find that the paper that is most independent is probably most read. 
Um, so, so I have a strong view about politicians taking their cue from the, from the population and the newspaper is just a medium how to inform the, the, the population. And, and that is often forgotten. Uh, at the end of the day, government must regulate to some extent, but it needs to be remembered that they serve us and not the media government. Thank you very much. Mr. Ombudsman Say. Um, what is your role in, um, in media matters? I mean, do you take initiative? Do you wait until you are invoked? Uh, what has been your experience during your reign? Thanks very much, Bob, for the question. Well, the Namibian media adheres to the process of self-regulation. And for that, they came up with uh, a code of conduct, code of ethics and conduct, that regulates the, the conduct of media practitioners in Namibia. And when we say that, we, we talk about media being both print, electronic, and even broadcast. So the role of the media ombudsman essentially is really then to adjudicate over media complaints. The other part of the, and of course, holding media practitioners to the very standards that the media, that the minister mentioned, issues of truthfulness, issues of accuracy, issues of fairness, impartiality, and he mentioned um, the issue of humanity. We've got practical examples, it's like of, of the, 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 the example of, of humanity. Two years ago, or half a year ago, um, the Informante published a very gruesome paper, now a picture rather, of someone that committed suicide. And the Informante published this gruesome paper on, on their web, Facebook webpage. The family was the first to complain. And as the media ombudsman, I've received over six complaints. Now the media, the code of ethics talk about publishing such kind of gratuitous um, pictures, obscene images and whatever. And this is the kind of humanity that the minister is talking about. Don't, with the words that you are using, the pictures that you are using should not cause more harm than necessary. And because um, media practitioners are part of society. So the code adheres to that. And lastly, whether the media ombudsman goes out and initiate, no. Because that would go against the very grain of the fundamental principle of fairness. Because you cannot be a prosecutor and a judge in the same matter. So for that reason, the media ombudsman, just like any adjudicator, a magistrate don't go out, even if the magistrate see that someone has committed a crime and whatever, you don't go and go and arrest that person because tomorrow you must adjudicate over that very same matter. So it's the same principle that apply. So I hope I've answered the question. Minister, I don't want these uh, journalists, uh, these uh, media practitioners and their protector to gag you. Uh, are they still behaving stately on that platform? Yeah, but before I go that, I would like to go back just to clarify and elaborate more on the question of impartiality that I spoke about. When I talk about impartiality, these words go together, impartiality and fairness. Uh, the key word here is objectivity. You, yes, you may be a newspaper belonging to a political party or to whatever, but you must be objective. It shouldn't be because the public is able to make a choice, I can just say anything. We are trying to guard against recklessness and irresponsibility. So that we must bear in mind. Yes, now, on the question of whether the media practitioners have been following or not, it boils down to the report of the ombudsman. If you look at the reports of the media ombudsman, obviously there have been complaints about media practitioners, but we can't have a blanket labeling that all media practitioners 
have not been following the standards. There are those that are following standards. There are those that may have followed standards. The question is, has it been intentional or unintentional when these practitioners are following the standards or not? That's one. Two, what remedy has been made to those that have been harmed by those type of reporting. That is another issue that we need to look at. Because, as I was saying, it is not just good enough to say, I can always do anything, I can always come and say sorry. So that should not be the way, but uh, we must have ethical principles. We must take responsibilities before we act. Thank you. Uh, yes, please, sure. Just directly responding to the minister's complaint. Like, obviously, it's like when, when the media or journalist was wrong, of course, the person would complain to the media ombudsman. And we've got instances. I've, I've got examples. You've asked me to give examples of cases. We've got one of the first cases that I adjudicated over uh, soon after my appointment was from a Dutch gentleman that complained against a non-member of the EFN, EFN being the Editor's Forum of Namibia, and the code being voluntary only applies to members. But we had Mr. John Swichler that in February this year actually sent me a WhatsApp to say thank you for the effort that the media ombudsman um, embarked upon to get his name cleared. Because what happened in this case, the informante had a, long, had a series of stories accusing this gentleman of being sought by uh, Interpol. And this gentleman provided evidence that neither South Africa, neither the Interpol branch in Namibia, in Rome, in Holland, and even in America, where he was residing, had him on his list. And so I took this matter up with the, with the informante. And I can say, uh, to the credit of informante, even though they were not even supposed to even begin to listen to me because they are not members, but harm has been caused. And they were uh, gracious enough and bold enough to admit mistake and to delete that offending articles from their webpage. And as you go now, it is not on their webpage. And so this is the remedies that uh, is available to whoever is complaining to the media ombudsman some of the remedies that can be taken. And we've done that. Frank, I see you are jittering. Yeah, I, I would like to come in here. Um, I think we, we, we must just be aware of thinking that we need to defend each and every case, and surely we have to and we have to report on that. But if you generally look at how many reports actually land in John's uh, uh, office for, for investigation, I believe there are not that many. If you really consider how many papers we have, how many radio stations we have, plus the TV broadcasting and whatever we else have, um, then generally, if you, if you judge Namibia, I would think that most reports are actually independent and quite fair. Uh, because otherwise you would be inundated with complaints, which you're not. Um, just to say, you know, we, uh, most of us uh, uh, journalists who, who really, as I say, the good journalists out there certainly believe in a code of ethics, and that goes without saying. Uh, that having been said, a code of ethics is only words on paper. In just about every situation and every newspaper and other journalistic entity, just about on a daily basis. One has to interpret that code. There are lots of gray areas. Everything is not black and white. Um, you can use a phrase and say, thou shalt not do harm. Uh, but that's easier said than done. Obviously, to the innocents out there, we don't want them to be harmed, which is why we have someone like John and self-regulation to protect exactly those, the innocent people. On the other hand, because the media um, is operating without fear and favor, largely speaking, they will be revealing things to the public. They will be revealing um, bad governance, exposing corruption, um, digging out things that people do not want to be dug out and don't want to see the light of day. And in the process, people arguably are harmed, right? 
If we look at the recent fish rot expose, there are top people in Namibia still sitting in jail today, some months later. Um, have they been harmed? Yes, they have been harmed. But the question then comes in, they did something bad, and so that harm has come to them as a result of corrupt activity. So we must be careful about talking about this harm thing. We must also be honest and say that a lot of the time, our politicians and people in positions of power are in a defensive position vis-a-vis -vis the media. They seem to only see the front page and the politics. The media is about a whole lot more than that. And I think credit needs to be given to the media in general for the huge role they play educationally and otherwise, all the other things they report on which are not political. We tend to sort of overlook that, and I think uh, that's important just to remind ourselves. Um, one minister once said to me, um, I will never bash press freedom or the importance of access to information. And he said, the reason I'm telling you that is because one day, I'm going to be a civilian myself, and I'm not going to be so defensive about the information I hold, and I'm going to want that kind of access that most Namibians want to enjoy today. So I think we need to remember that a lot of these issues we talk about in black and white are actually very nuanced and need to be interpreted as we go forward. Where are matters with regard to the international landscape with regard to the issues that we are discussing. I mean, we are focusing on Namibia. Can maybe, uh, Mr. Ombudsman, uh, is the situation obtaining? Are these uh, liberties that we are discussing obtaining globally, or do we have hotspots someplace around the world? Yeah, obviously the right to freedom of expression is an internationally recognized um, right enshrined in the UDHR, meaning the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is also enshrined in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And similarly for the African continent, the right to freedom of expression, freedom of the media, access to information is also enshrined and protected and guaranteed in the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. And the African Commission on Human and People's Rights is very, very clear. These rights enshrined they are not charity. It is not because of the goodwill of government or the kind-heartedness of government that we are enjoying the, the freedom of the press, the, the space that we are having. Uh, it is not. These are the birthrights of the people. And it is not been given to us by any government. And so, and this is what in a day like this, this is what we want to celebrate. The fact that we are enjoying these freedoms. And of course there are threats, uh, verbal threats, and whatever the case may be. I've read, for example, the, the opinion piece by uh, Dr. Engari. It's like, and I'm saying, what are you trying to say here? What, what veil, is, 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 it, is it a threat? To, 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 to media freedom and press freedom? Do you want the media to be hand clappers and whatever? I said, no. Don't make us think that you are doing us a favor by allowing these freedoms and whatever to obtain. No, not. And as was mentioned, there are other countries in the world which are not as free as Namibia. And, but we are saying that we are glad that in Namibia, we are enjoying the kind of freedoms that we are enjoying, but we want to stress it is not out of charity. It is because right to freedom of expression, right to access to information, right to the media, freedom of the media, these are inalienable rights. Frank, are these, these statues that are enshrined uh, obtaining, are they working, are they holding, or are they collecting dust someplace? Well, I wouldn't specifically say they're collecting dust. Uh, I think, generally speaking, Namibia surely is in a good space as opposed to international other countries, wh wh wherever you look. But my biggest problem is always that we've, we've, re we've remained on position number 23 on the international list of uh, free media. But my problem is that at the end of the day, we want to improve. Now, typically, what you found is that uh, 
Namibia is wanting, especially in terms of giving too much leeway or the, or, uh, the government actually uh, involving state media, uh, uh, preferably over that of, of private media. Now, I must be honest, I'm not, not so much concerned whether something is private or whether something is public media. I'm more confer, uh, concerned about fairness. We should all be competing on the same level. And, and typically what we found with COVID now is that uh, media didn't really ask that many questions. They simply acted and they started informing, educating. Um, we, we just saw that all the papers stood together and got this education, uh, um, uh, this booklets going out for, for the various classes. And it's, it's not one media house only, it's all types of educational material going out there because the one might have the uh, one idea, the other one might have a different idea. But the fact is, if it comes push to shove, media stands together. And there I find it sad that when we find in present day that just after we've been reconfirmed on position 23 and first in Africa, then we find with COVID that suddenly the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the president's office uh, suddenly only allows selected media to come in for, for, for press conferences. That is exactly not what we need. And it, it is totally against this old thing that we've been waiting for three years, access to information. The Access of, uh, to Information Act is gathering dust and nobody knows why. We've been able to get emergency uh, um, acts through for, for COVID in a matter of seven days, but we're unable to get an act uh, through for media after three years. So in that respect, I think we're wanting. We are currently going through some cutthroat and unforgiving economic times in which uh, uh, revenues seem to be declining, broadly speaking. Uh, now, media houses, are uh, they feeling the pinch, or is this just a storm in a teacup? felt it for a while already because obviously with the economic slump you already felt and I think we spoke about it before at other times um, media generally has found that uh, income has been uh, de like depreciating second to none and the COVID one really is a final slap in the face so I think a couple of the papers will seriously have a problem in trying to survive the next few months never mind a year so I think this is a, the important part especially now that government really should step in and see how they can help and, 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 and spread that income from government on a more evenly basis, because it has not happened in the past. What makes you tick? What makes media tick, Gwen? Do you think they are ticking, or do you think they are crawling, or is just a, yeah, well, at this a brave point, face? Yeah, I think it's important to say, Bob, we all talk about the need for press freedom and the importance of it, um, but we won't need press freedom if there are no independent press. And I think this is a very stark reality that is facing much of what we call the legacy or the traditional media at the moment, not just in Namibia, in Africa, but across the, the globe, uh, where obviously more and more people have moved online, uh, where we obviously face those huge threats of disinformation in, in massive amounts. Good journalism is battling to survive at the moment. Uh, we need to find ways and means to sustain it. And again, I think it's important to emphasize good journalists, journalism isn't just about the journalists or the media that they serve. It is in the service of the people. Um, and I think that we're going to go through some very tough times. And, and I think World Press Freedom Day actually gives us opportunity to also actually call on people in general to say, you know what, support good journalism. Because take it away, and you have a complete vacuum. You have governments who will do what they will with you, um, and um, you will not have any kind of free access to the information you need to make good decisions about your life. So I think journalism is in danger. Good journalism is in danger, and I think it's up to all of us to, to try and save it. Um, I think it's largely due, obviously, to digitization. Uh, it's much easier for people to go online and, and, and do a couple of clicks than it is to read a newspaper article. But I think, again, we need to try and bring people back to traditional media. Perhaps all is not lost. The COVID-19 pandemic, I'm told, for example, in the UK, 
by the Ethical Journalism Network has resulted in the fact that more and more people are turning away from disinformation now and seeking out good and verifiable uh, means of information and that they're going back to some of the traditional media. Um, I hope it's not going to be too late, but this, I think, is going to be the biggest challenge for journalism and journalists in the years to come, is how to save it, how to get the public trust back and believing in good journalism as being absolutely essential in their day-to-day -day lives. And, and that brings us there, Frank, to the role of that advertising play in the, in the life of media houses. I mean, are they are the advertisers uh, uh, partners in this development, or are just a withering breeze degenerating into some, some moving targets? I think what really happens is that you generally find that most, uh, whether it be, be printing press or uh, even NBC uh, television and, and, and radio, there is no person today who can uh, still maintain his media network without also being on the net. And this is really what it is all about. Instead of just fighting the net, uh, use it for your own purposes. And in the process, you will surely find advertisers who over time start advertising again or continue advertising, possibly even advertising more. Because the principle is really this, coming back to the argument of Gwen just now. If you've got a believable press, some, and, and, and uh, I want to assure the minister that uh, I think I'm not far away when I say 99.9% .9 of the journalists try and uh, write uh, truthful. Uh, they, they, they don't try and have a political agenda on their mind. I'm, I'm not saying there are none but uh, I absolutely believe the majority does uh, report what they've just witnessed. And that's really what they are. Uh, they're witnesses to an occurrence and they need to report about it. And this is where the truthfulness and the respect comes in. As soon as people start realizing, but you know what, when, when Frank has written about something, it's true. And, and, and they start relying on Frank always confirming that ultimate truth. So they'll start uh, writing, uh, reading other papers as well, but ultimately they'll come back to Frank's, uh, whatever, internet presence or paper. And they see, but he has not lied once again. And then suddenly for the advertiser, you become real value because they know that people will ultimately return back to be it a paper, be it the television show, be it whatever it is. And I think that's the importance. So, so advertisers, yes, they're partners, for sure. And even the government in that respect. I mean, like I just said earlier, um, in, in terms of Ministry of Education has proved itself to be one huge partner to the press at the moment. So, so I, I truly feel that these sort of partnerships should be Quite, uh, should be coming quite naturally. It shouldn't be a concerted e effort by either partner. And, and so I'm coming back to this Access to Information Act. I truly feel, coming back to Gwen's argument earlier, if access to information is allowed, you will surely find that many of the accusations and speculations and so on will fall by the wayside. Simple reason, the person has got the fact right from the start. He doesn't need to speculate. And that is the problem that you often have. People sort of throw a stone into the bush and hoping to rattle something. And then government comes out and says, no, but you've lied about this. No, he hasn't lied. He was wondering whether this could be true because he's heard it from several sources and government has not reacted to any question about that incident. And that is where I feel government has a very strong role to play. Get that information act through and have us all work as partners and not as, as, as two opposing parties. In a minute, we shall be opening our public lines. And the number is uh, 064 400 397. Did I say 064? That's not true. 061 400 397. Jot it down, please. 061 400 397. I don't want somebody scribbling a message to me. No, I don't want that. 400 397. Minister, maybe we must talk a bit about the quality of journalism in Namibia. Do they account? promote transparency, do they disseminate quality information uh, con that contribute to ethical uh, behavior, do they base their communication on, on, on facts, 
or is this business uh, as usual, uh, bashing the state and showing how ministers are stealing money and all these things? Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, uh, as I said earlier, you have what Gwen has been calling good journalism. You have journalists that are there to disseminate information. Transparency is a very important, even our president has always been calling on ministers to be transparent, to say when the media are calling upon you, you must provide information. So you have the media that have been reporting on the transparency part of the government, exposing also those activities that are found to be wanting in society. You have those journalists that have been reporting objectively again in their stories. They make sure that they, their facts are accurate. I recall when I was a minister of urban and rural development, I was probably one of the most sought after ministers by the media. And you have really those journalists that would call, and when they do not get hold of you, they would call again until you provide information. And then we have a typical of those who call you once, knowing very well you might be in cabinet, and then they say, the minister was not reachable, so they write anyhow. So you have two different types of people, but you have those that are really trying to make sure that they get across facts as they are. Or when they hear a story from one party, they would always want to say, we want to hear the side, your side, what is your take on this? Uh, we have journalists that we should really give uh, we should really commend for having stood up to the ethics of media and ethics of reporting. Thank you very much, Minister. We, we are ready to take our first caller, um, Joel from Swakopmund. Joel from Swakopmund, please uh, put, put, put your question across or your comment, make it succinct, make it as brief as possible, please, so we can move forward. Okay. Joel? Joel? Hello, sir. Hi. I'm fine, how are you? Fine, thank you. Yes. I would like to ask uh, regarding coronavirus. Uh, years ago, we used to have our medicine. Uh, and I just want to ask if, uh, like Master Kandito, if uh, people like some people, are, where they consulted regarding this, maybe they might have help us to this disease. Or perhaps at the north, we have different kind of herbalists which we use to treat those kind of virus. That's my question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Minister, you are on the spot. You are the closest to coronavirus. Uh, thank you very much. This, uh, if I get the color, uh, clearly, he is asking about those herbalists or the sons, whether they were consulted about treating the coronavirus and so on. You see, this is a new disease, and before you start treating, you need to test, because you do not just want to start treating people without testing whether what you are treating them with is really verifiable. So as of now in the world, and we are not only talking about Namibia, in the world, people are busy looking for the medicine, either in terms of vaccine or in terms of treatment. You can't run to herbalists for something that has not been tested, because first they must understand what corona is, what causes, what causes this disease. First, we must understand it before we go to treatment. John, ethical conduct, you are the protector of media. Uh, and uh, the work of media is uh, from time to time contested, and they contest other people's work, of course, also. Who must tell whom what about ethical behavior? Lawmakers or media or public media as they check ministers um, and the role of the ombudsman, just where do we, how do we try to pull a thread through all these things? Well, as I already mentioned in the beginning, uh, Bob, it's like, the code is very clear, the code of conduct is very clear. It, is, it, it lays down in terms of uh, the very ethical standards that media practitioners must comply with. It's really very clear in terms of um, accuracy, truthfulness, at the risk of repeating. 
myself. It's like these are the, the things that the Code of Ethics really kindly or, or very clearly spells out. So it's a question of the, the, the public coming, coming to complain and that said that media practitioners are not uh, adhering to the very codes of conduct, standards of conduct that the, the code of conduct is asking them to comply with. So it's about the public complaining against the, I mean, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the conduct of, of a journalist. So it's really the public dictating what they perceive to be accurate, impartial, and not being the truth in some cases. Thank you very much. We have another caller, Martin from Kietmans. Martin, welcome. Please be as brief as you can, and let's go. Good morning. Morning, sir. My, I have just a simple question. Dr. Whom are we educating? Because from the beginning, when the updating started, it's only being focusing on the English. Then we have the people in the rural area, especially senior citizens, which the information which is being the news being given, it's not to really just give exactly as it has been said. How do we need to make sure that all the people across the country get the same information? Why on the radio cannot have the translations? Who can be able to translate on the different languages at the same time? Yes, Martin. What, thank you very, very much. What we know is that uh, every day after this formal national presentation that goes on the national language, which is the English, I'm talking about the national conversation language, then all our radio stations do a summary in the vernacular. That has been happening. I live on the farm and I don't always uh, sit at the television. I drive it around, I drive a car, or I ride a horse, and I can, I can hear these happening. So yes, I hear you wish everybody would be following now on television at the same time sitting in, but unfortunately, for now, that could be a discussion for another day. The truth is, yes, nobody's losing out on this information. Minister, you wanted to pick up. Yes, I just wanted to confirm what we are saying, that in as much as the live broadcast during 10 and 11 at the COVID center are conducted in English, the news desk goes and summarizes the salient points that are transmitted to different radio stations in their respective languages. So the key information is not lost. Everyone get to know what is happening, where do we stand with the statistics on the COVID, and what are the measures that government has put in place, what are the new regulations. All these things are transmitted in various radio stations. And in fact, it happens immediately after this broadcast, so it's not, it's not lost. Yes, Frank? Let me just add in there, it's, it's not only the radios that have it in the uh, vernacular that they're specifically concentrating on. Most papers in this country have one or another section in, in any number of uh, languages where, where they've also educated the people. And then there's the big thing that I always feel is most important. There's always responsibility from the citizen themselves. There is no rule that says that Martin cannot go and take the paper to his parents who might not be as fluent in English as he is and explain what he's just read. Um, there seems to be that sort of uh, attitude, it's government's uh, responsibility to always inform us and do this, that and another. Yes, it is, but it needs to be within reason. And I'm, I'm probably the last person to always stand up for government, but in this case I truly feel we all have a responsibility to inform our elders, and make sure that our children understand it cannot be only government that informs. Thank you very much. Mr. Ombudsman. We live in this era of misinformation, disinformation, fake news, proper news, created uh, news. This is in part as a result of this uncontrollable advent of technology brought about by the advent of, uh, of the information age. Are journalists behaving? Is it holding? How many times per week do you feel like uh, uh, telling the minister to lock up somebody or or telling uh, the journalist or telling somebody to be taken into court. Are you content with the Dudra Fansake as things are happening now with regard to all these things? 
Is there an equilibrium and is everyone treating everyone well? Are there forums for sorting these things or do you sort them just through boardroom conference time, uh, shouting matches? How is it happening? Right. I wish I could uh, quote, yes. but I don't have it now yet. I, can't, I don't want to open my phone now, but I'm going to paraphrase what the UN General Secretary General said uh, on this particular day. Let me, let me, I, I don't want to rush you. Okay. Let me just cut you short so we take another, another caller so that you can be as long-winded as it possible. Mr. Kamati from? From Angwena. Mr. Kamati from Angwena. Welcome, sir. All right. I, I would like to ask a question. Yes, please. Um, my question is, you see, if you look at uh, worldwide, most of uh, journalists are just to be found in, a town, in towns. So my question is, why are they not uh, uh, going to rural areas and uh, uh, um, looking at how our people are surviving and uh, yeah, something like that? Because most of people, they don't know what is going on in a rural area. That is my question. Yes, please. Thank you so much, Kamati. Journalist, uh, Gwen, Frank, why are you keeping all your journalists in window one? Well, I think uh, obviously it's a, it's, it's, it's a fair criticism. Um, I don't think it's entirely true. I mean, the journalists, in as much as they are able and as much as budgets allow, uh, certainly get out into those areas. And many of the media have offices uh, which can cover uh, rural constituencies. But that having been said, there can always more can be done. There's no question about that. Um, again, it argues for people who make requests like this gentleman has just done to say, where's the media in rural areas? If we are not supporting the media, if we are not um, buying your newspaper or subscribing uh, to a, a radio station or whatever, there's not going to be the money to send uh, people out into those areas. And this is going to be something that is going to cripple the media going forward. Uh, unless a solution can be found and unless the public really turns back the clock and starts supporting traditional media once, uh, once again. When you think of it, um, those three to five dollars it may cost you to buy a newspaper, uh, what is the equivalence of that in terms of data? Not very much. And if you read a newspaper of your choice that's a good one, you get some really good informu information in that newspaper. So again, it's back to the people, really. They must, now the ball's in their court. They must decide whether they want to support public interest media. Because at the end of the day, if they don't buy that me those media, if they don't support them with advertisements, it's going to leave a vacuum and a void, and that vacuum is going to be filled by the disinformation that proliferates on social media. Uh, take even what's happening here today. If it was not for the NBC, take it away. People would not have the advantage of hearing this discussion. Or, so they must realize how important uh, media is in their lives. And the more they support it, the more the media will come to them. Thanks. This uh, reminds sorry. me, yes, please. please. Sorry, I just want to come in there as well. I totally agree with what Gwen has said. And make no mistake, we've got quite, quite a lot of uh, journalists out there. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't bring the news, um, and I know in, in her papers, uh, case, my papers, case, whatever, we have these reports coming from the north and south and wherever. It could be so much better, but it is really this. And, and I would to just quickly like to illustrate the problem that papers have. I'm the editor of Allgemeine Zeitung. Okay, now obviously I'm an absolute minority group in this country. So to drive up two papers to Katima Mulilu, I mean, imagine, I would have to ask probably what, I don't know, a thousand bucks for one paper? Does that make sense? No, it doesn't make sense. So suddenly Katima Mulilo has lost a certain value for me in terms of getting a journalist there. But if I had to sell 200 papers there a day, my mind would change immediately. And I think that's the problem that every paper is sitting with. So if you want to, to have a regular paper up in, in Ruakana, then you need to start talking to your people and say, guys, come on. It's not that we can't afford it at all. We can at least buy a paper once in a while. And I know paper is on the way out, but even then, going onto the internet, using that source of information is what actually keeps us 
in the system. Thank you, Frank. We have Hangula from Swakop Moon. Hangula yes. from Swakop Moon. Good morning, Hangula. Yes, good morning, sir. How are you? Fine, thank you. All right. Um, I would like just to give a contribution, not really a question. Um, my my uh, contribution to Ombudsman. Angula? Yes? Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. you. You're a bit fast. Can you go as slow as you can, please? All right. Um, I'll do so. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you, but I think you were rushing. Okay. Yeah. Just, uh, I don't have a really a question, but just in a contribution. Yes. Can you hear me? Sure, sure, sure. Julie, please. All right. Um, uh, according to Ombudsman, how really they give information? Because we uh, we are not access to really what actually Ombudsman for. Uh, because now, as I heard, it's also in communicating with the media. So whenever now there's information that needed to be contributed to the, uh, the nation, so how it uh, how the law. The, uh, for the, how the law is ruling the, the, the media's house. Because as you see, uh, the information that is coming to, to, to the public, it's really, uh, it's really something that you can uh, recall. Not all of us, we, uh, we really can take how the media is going to uh, contribute that to the nation. Because as you see, most of, uh, most of the media or journalists, they... They only uh, provide information which is actually uh, on urban area side. But uh, the rural areas, they, uh, they are really struggling on to do so. And as you see, the ombudsman's offices only uh, up across the urban areas. But uh, the rural areas, there is no ombudsman. If I'm, maybe I'm uh, on the correction side. Thank you very, very much. Yes. Yeah, it, you, 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 that was a contribution, isn't it? Yes, that was my contribution. Angula? Yes, sir. That was a contribution. Thank you very much. All right, sir. Thank you. Yes, please, uh, Ombudsman. It's raising. In fact, I've raised it also with, in my annual report to the EFN uh, in November last year, is that um, a lot of people are not aware of the existence of the office. Um, and th that might be ascribed to the fact that there's not a lot of publicity. I remember shortly after I was appointed, um, FAS uh, Media, together with the EFN, organized a, a session for the media, introducing the media ombudsman to, to, to I think we went to Katima. And, and, and shortly after this, and, and of course we had a breakfast meeting whereby the media ombudsman was introduced to the general public and a lot of people attended. And in that year, we've received, shortly after that, we've received a lot of complaints. Of course, some of them were worth complaining, but others not. But the point was that people got to know about this office. And that's why I've mentioned in my in my. 2018 report to the EFN that there's a need to, to, to assist the, the office, to make the office much more visible and to take the, the office out and announce this office because many people, uh, especially the poor, it's like some of them have been reported on in an unfair manner. But because they don't know about the existence of this office, they don't know what to do and how to complain or how to lay a complaint. So the point by Angula, I think, is one worth uh, taking up and a very valid one. Thank you very much. We have extended the discussion to 12 o'clock by popular demand. Some of the, the pensioners uh, ganged up and flooded uh, the, the, the uh, OB van with uh, phone calls. They are saying they want to see more elderly uh, presenting, uh, uh, doing what I'm doing today. Thank you so much to my colleagues. So we shall extend the discussion to 12 o'clock. We have Nangolo from Ongwediva on the line. Nangolo, good morning. Um, good morning, Mr. Gandeto. Yes, please. Um, it's it, it, so reassuring to see you uh, moderating there. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and also good morning to, to the panel there. 
um, I, 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 was, I was trying to, to get through, and I didn't hear whether anybody asked the, the minister there, where is the access to the information bill? We, we have been waiting for some time now. Um, the other one was that uh, a little comment I wanted to make. Uh, the state information machinery, to me, looks a bit rogue. Uh, because, for example, if you take the information that we're getting surrounding the, 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 the COVID-19 updates, it's, it's, it's uh, up and forth, you know, from, from, especially from the Ministry of Health. Uh, it, there's not a lot of uh, clear information coming out of there. And this gives us um, a, a feeling of suspicion uh, uh, towards the, the information from, from the state, from the government. Uh, and here I must congratulate the, 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 the private media uh, for uh, dissemination of information. But then uh, it's not conf information that comes there when it co comes to the government spokesperson. They do not confirm anything, neither do they deny. And hence it, it, it worries us because now we have this um, fake news issue. You don't know now. When is it fake news? When is it true? Because nobody is confirming anything. Uh, uh, the other one, um, what was the other point? Uh, um, well, unfortunately, I seem to have forgotten the third one, but those two actually. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Nangolo. We are now formally, Nangolo, not because I don't like you, but we are now formally closing the lines in order to move forward and uh, allow the media to interact uh, with the panelists. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the callers. Uh, these were very, very informative uh, and interactive um, uh, interactions did. Thank you very much. The, uh, take a deep breath. Media is spoiled. They want to come ask questions and disappear. It didn't work that way today. You woke up very early. But of course, you're losing nothing. There are no mummy's nights and all these things. There's a big lockdown, so it's OK. You are not tired. That's good. Media. Gwen, you, you, you wanted to interject something, isn't it? Sorry, whether uh, the gentleman's question wasn't quite relevant, whether we shouldn't quickly yeah, no, no, sure, sure. touch no, I'm on that. To that. I'm just trying to, to okay. just let, uh, reassure my colleagues from media that uh, we did not forget you are here. We wanted to keep you longer here so you can be part of listening, man, not just ask questions. Uh, Gwen? Um, just to say very briefly that uh, I just think it's worth emphasizing, and I don't think we've done that yet, the really um, inextricable connection between press freedom, free expression, and access to information. I don't think we can emphasize strongly enough that you won't find that one exists without the other, or to its, its maximum impact, put it that way. Can you, can you again tie the thread between the three, please? Sorry? Can you again repeat the three that you mentioned? Um, access to information, press freedom, and free expression. Yeah. That the link there is, is inextricable. Um, and that usually if you have one of those rights, you will have all of them or you will have none of them. So I think it's very important. And the gentleman did ask the question for a couple of years now. Obviously, we've had the promise of an access to information law in Namibia. I actually thought that the fact that we hadn't got it through by last year, the end of last year, would mean that we might lose our number one spot in the Africa Press Freedom Rankings. That didn't happen. Um, but as I say, I think we really now are impelled to, to put such a law in place. Again, the law isn't specifically for the media. It's for the people in order that they may access the information they need to make good decisions about their lives, wherever they may be. And of course, it also helps considerably the work of the media themselves, especially when they come up against secrecy, if they are doing investigative reporting into corruption or anything else, whether it concerns government, private sector, whatever. So again, I think we must just not leave here today without seeing the importance of those three things being linked together. Thank you. Minister? Yes, I want to respond to say government is not unaware of the importance of access to information. That's why those that have been following, it was announced last year by the then Deputy Minister of Information that the bill has been finalized on the part of the government. It is with the legal drafters, and once the legal drafters finalize it, it will come to be dealt with through the normal process that bills are dealt with to become acts. 
The Minister of Justice is not here today. We must tap her on the, the knuckles. But no, she's new. Don't, don't be tough on her. It's fine. Yes. Uh, Frank, you wanted to... No, I would just like to emphasize the fact that if we, in the spotlight next year for, for celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Vintuk Declaration, then I think it would just be a, a sure bright light on, on the Namibian uh, uh, government as well as media as such if that act is passed long before then. Because that's really where we impress people out there and that's where we keep our role as, as, uh, as giving an example to the rest of Africa. Like I said earlier, uh, you know, place number one in Africa is obviously good to have. But by the same token, I always believe once, if we know that we've been on place number 23 for two consecutive years, we should move all types of uh, uh, machinations to make sure that next year at least we reach 22 or even 21, preferably even better than that, because there was a time when we were even much better than this. So we shouldn't uh, sit back and say, ach, don't worry, we were able to keep our position. It's not about being number one in, in Africa anymore. It's uh, slowly climb that, climbing that ladder to, to possibly one day be number one in the world. I wouldn't think that's impossible. Thank you very much. The media is already on the line, um, standing in line. You know, we must separate these things. On the line is something different from standing on line. Dwight Links from the Namibian newspaper. Yes, please. Um, this is actually for a question for the entire panel, but mostly also for the minister, if he can start. Um, the Ministry of Education introduced Swahili as a language that they want to introduce how will the Ministry of Information and as well as media practitioners try to get that language on board? Because we already have English as our national medium, and to introduce something that's a continental medium uh, for communication, how will we try and, try and incorporate that? I mean, we already have our, uh, our ethnic tribes all with their languages and all with their traditional mediums. Swahili is another thing on the horizon. How will we try to gauge that? What is the practice? You, do you take a question as it comes, or do you, do you take questions as they come, or do you collect them? Maybe because we have some time, let's take questions as they come. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Swahili, I, I do not know, I, I, I did not get him well. He seems to imply that it is becoming a medium. It is not becoming a medium of instruction like English is, is, be, is becoming a language to be introduced in school. So, so you don't make a language a medium of instruction when the majority of the population have not mastered that language. So it is becoming a language to be introduced. And introducing a language like Swahili will be like introducing language like French in some of the schools that we have, or Portuguese and whatsoever. It is advantages to us as a Namibian community because this is, as you are saying, is more or less like a continental language. Actually, in the African Union, Swahili is recognized as one of the official languages. It's just that it will be an added advantage to those that speak English and you speak Swahili when you go to African Union conferences or when you travel all over Africa. So let me tell you, I speak basic Swahili, which I've picked on my own. When I went to observe elections in the Democratic Republic of Congo in 2005, we were deployed in an area that is predominantly French speaking. We were given a translator who himself could not really express himself in English, I was able to translate for our group because of the Swahili that I'm able to pick up because it is more or less related to Oshwamba, which I speak, Oshwamba and Oshierero. This is more or less the same. I was able to effectively translate to our groups because of that. So don't think that Swahili is just a language that is going to be spoken here. It is spoken, it is an official language in Kenya, Tanzania. It is spoken in part of Uganda, Democratic Republic of Congo, East and Central Africa. Thank you. You're taking it, Gwen? Are you all right? Okay. Thierry, freelance journalist. Colleagues from the media, I'm requesting you to stay. Don't ask a question and run away, please. I deployed somebody who will take a picture of anybody who leaves earlier. 
Okay, good morning to the panelists. Uh, my first question goes to Gwen. Uh, as a veteran journalist, I suppose uh, World Press Freedom Day this year comes at a time where some print media houses are struggling to print and supposedly sinking. Uh, journalists sometimes get, um, under work, get to work under very difficult conditions, salaries being cut without being following uh, procedures, and some just being laid off willy-nilly by some of the media owners. You, as a veteran journalist who has been there through thick and thin, what do you think is the way to remedy this for the journalists and also for the sinking newspapers? Then to Frank, could you clearly articulate what role does the Editors Forum play in bettering the standards or conditions of work for journalists who are somehow exploited when they're coming from college and some that are also working there? Because I think media also, we have this term where we say overworked and underpaid. Thank you. Gwen? Thanks very much. Um, you know, it's a, it's a good question, as I say, which we've touched on. And I wish I, I had the answers. Um, as someone who is, uh, <clears throat> could I say, a newspaper person in bone and marrow, uh, since that's where I started out my career and that's where I ended it, um, I really hope that newspapers can survive, if for no other reason, especially in the African context, than for reasons of literacy. Um, because I believe it's still a country where we get so little reading material out into the rural areas particularly, that at least people keep, keep abreast and keep appraised of things by reading the newspaper. So again, I'd like to see it saved. You correct also that obviously this, these new constraints on the media, um, financial constraints, as I say, not only because of COVID, but exacerbated by that, um, has resulted in a lot of journalists losing their jobs all over the world, uh, as print media particularly dies, um, and a lot of good people leaving the profession and going elsewhere. And it, it's, it's got to be a dilemma at some point because we need to save those journalists and their jobs. Um, and instead of them having to face retrenchments and less money, and then also, let's face it, to often be the people in the front line of danger, not only during the COVID-19 pandemic, but in the normal run of their work, whether they're covering wars or famines or whatever, trying to bring information um, to the people that they put themselves in danger so much and now they have to face, obviously, their jobs being cut, their salaries being cut. This is a reality at the moment. Um, and I think we really, and most of us in the media industry are trying to put our heads together and really think of innovative solutions, how to save good journalism, even if we can't save newspapers the way they used to be, at least in some form or another. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, I think I actually still had an answer to give on, on EFN. Um, just quickly, I think it's very important to understand the Editors Forum of Namibia is not a workers' union. It is a forum where we self-regulate the content of our pages, making sure that we stay to moral and ethic and, and all those subjects. So while the EFN would all, always support the, the possible uh, future, uh, what do you call it, uh, creation of, that, uh, of such a unit, it really is up to the journalists to come together and do that. It shouldn't be the EFN, because uh, you will invariably end up in the conflict of interest over time. Thank you. John? Can I just add yes, please. Like, in fact, yesterday I went through the Vinduk Declaration that was mentioned earlier. And it actually says exactly what Frank is saying. It's like there should be ideally an association, and Gwen can correct me, and it should, there should ideally be an association for publishers, one for editors, and an association for journalists. So journalists, they are workers. So in other words, they must take the initiative to establish a, a union, or whatever it's called, that would look after their own interests. Thank you very much, Norma. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Zoe Titus. I'm with the Namibia Media Trust. I have um, two questions for the minister and one for the ombudsman. Uh, minister, 
Namibia ranks number one in Africa in terms of the press freedom ranking, so it's considered a beacon of hope on the continent. I'd like to know if the Namibian government would consider extending um, the work or, or see a role for itself in promoting press freedom and media freedom outside the borders of Namibia. And then I say that whilst I also acknowledge the fact that for two consecutive years now, our government has opted not to co-sponsor a resolution on the safety of journalists. So just in that context. And then a question to you, Minister, economically, and I mean it's been stated here on the panel, um, the media sector is reading from the impact of COVID, digitalization, and, and other issues. Uh, would you be considering uh, promoting a relief package for the, for the media, aside from what the ministry is currently envisioning with respect to a sustainability strategy for community radio? And then to the Ombudsman, the press secretary in the office of the president seems to spend substantial time responding on perceived, um, uh, perceived attacks on the presidency and the person of the president. Have you engaged him about uh, the role that you have and the self-regulatory mechanism? Thank you so much. You are right. Are you? You are good. Okay, let me give you a breather. Um, I'm not going to sing a song, no, please. Not today. We have, as you, those of you who are alert, you'll see that we have mid-air changed uh, sign language interpreters. Um, we have now Megi Kashina Munene, who replaced the um, Selma Moses mid-air. You know, media, I want to make, when I deal with media, I want to make sure that uh, we are together every step of the way. The, because they may just keep, the sign language interpreter was, uh, when do we have changed in mid-air, mid mid somewhere along the line? Yes, please. Uh, she's, she's not, uh, she, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Edward Mumbu from uh, NAMPA. Uh, my questions, uh, the first question is directed to all the panelists. Uh, uh, please. Did, I think I did something wrong here. The, the, the first question was not answered. Am I correct? Yes, Ombudsman, you're supposed to be intervening in these things. <laughs> no, <laughs> yes, uh, please, sorry. I'm sorry, just don't worry. There were actually two questions directed to the minister. Yeah, sure, please, please. But I can you, can, you can, if it's a question that goes to the minister or to anybody else, you can chip in and say, Minister, I don't like but your answer. Let me start, since it is my responsibility. Oh, ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, one, there was a question of the relief package. Uh, the relief package is for everyone. It's not specific. Uh, we are already talking about being impartial. It's not specifically that we should single out one industry over other industries. If there's a relief package for all those that have uh, businesses or those that have employers that are unable to cope, there is that package. There will not be one for the media apart from that one because they are equally affected like all other businesses and they will fall under that relief package. That's one. On the question on whether we are going to promote media freedom outside, I would want to tell you that first media freedom is one of the many values and principles that we have enshrined in our constitution. And wherever government, the president and government ministers go in their bilateral exchange or in their multilateral forums, they promote these values. The fact that you have instances, as you have mentioned, that Namibia did not co-sponsor a resolution on the media does not mean that we are not promoting in our joint commissions with various countries. Information is one of the areas that we do communicate. Perhaps there were specific reasons why the country did not sponsor that particular resolution, depending on the wedding, because you must also look at some the way some of the resolutions are worded. But obviously, it is not to say Namibia is going to, but Namibia has already been exporting or has already been talking 
and promoting these values with her friends in the bilateral relations. Thank you, Gwen. Well, I'm going to chip in there and just to say to the minister that personally, as someone who really values and is very happy about Namibia's number one status in Africa and actively works towards that all the time, because press freedom is like democracy. It's very fragile. It's not something you can say, we have it today, let's just relax and go home. It's something we need to work on all the time. And it's always disappointed me that our government, which I know prides itself greatly on our number one position in Africa, has not used, if I may use the word, its muscle to spread the gospel of press freedom further afield. I hear what the minister is saying about bilateral talks and so on, but we would like to see our government vocal when it comes to the contravention of journalists' rights anywhere, especially on the continent. And I'm sorry to say they have taken a back seat. And if we were to do that, I think that's our way forward up from number 23 in the world. If our government was seen to be far more vocal about press freedom and as it applies in other countries uh, around the world. So that is something I would like to see. And again, um, as Zoe mentioned in her question, the issue about the resolutions uh, about impunity against safety of journalists um, was a great disappointment as well. And unfortunately, in those cases, Namibia aligned itself with some of the most authoritarian and draconian um, governments in the world by not voting in favor of those. So as I say, a lot of us who value press freedom, who value government's value of press freedom in this country, would like to see us do more and put our money where our mouths are. Thank you. Minister, you're right. Gwen has this capacity to hit below the belt if she wants to, so I want to make sure that you're right. Right of reply, you can chip in. Well, uh, suffice to reiterate what I said, that government, when they go in multilateral conferences, when they co-sponsor or support or vote for these resolutions, they are guided by some principles that the Ministry of International Relations and Cooperation provide. And I said one of the issues that we look at is the wording of the resolutions, because you might have some wordings that might not necessarily, we might not necessarily agree with. Yes, please. Yes, please. Good. I had a question with regard to Dr. Engari. Doctor? The press secretary. secretary. Engari, yes. Please. Yeah. Okay. You, um, you have a question with regard to him? No, no. Ah, yes. I'm sorry, you are responding to that question, yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm responding sure. to that question. Yes. It's like, for that question, I think it's just proper that I quote verbatim from what the UN Committee on Human Rights have said about some of the things that Mr. Engari or Dr. Engari has mentioned. And I'm reading it with, with uh, your indulgence. The mere, and this is, this is coming from General Command Number 30 of the United Nations Committee on Human Rights. And it says the following, Bob. The mere fact that form of expressions are considered to be insulting to a public figure is not sufficient to justify the imposition of penalties. It goes further, all public figures, including those exercising the highest political authority, such as a head of state and government, are legitimately subject to criticism and political opposition. That has been said by the UN uh, Committee on, on Human Rights. And so this is really I, the question that, that Zoe was asking is like whether I, as the media ombudsman, engage Dr. Engari. No, I haven't done so. But this will be some of the things, if I were to engage him, this will be some of the things that uh, I would tell him. For the politicians out there, and I don't want to sound disrespectful, there's a saying that says, if you cannot take the heat, get out of the kitchen. You had to develop 
a thick skin. It comes with the territory. So it, it shouldn't be taken personal. And international human rights law actually adheres to that very principle. That those, in, in, in English they are also saying the highest tree catches, how do you say it, Gwen? Catches the, the most wind. It really comes with that. Comes with the territory, Dr. Engari. Thank you. Yes, please. I'm sorry you stood for so long, uh, Mumbu. Yeah, no, it's, it's okay. Uh, as I said, my name is Edward. Uh, the first question is directed to the entire uh, panel. I just want to find out, uh, the, you, you all drove home the, 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 the issue of quality journalism. And uh, I've observed that if there are any media institutions, for one, or even the ministry, uh, I, I've not seen you promote uh, journalism in the world of academia, for example. I've not seen media houses go all out and pay tuition fees for their journalists to improve, although there are several conferences that journalists do go to, to attend and to learn from. You don't really uh, invest in your journalists to better their education and, uh, and eventually also improve, uh, improve their work. So I, I don't think it's also fair for you to demand these high standards of, from journalists, yet you don't invest in journalists to also improve their work. That's one. I also just uh, need a comment in that regard. Uh, the second one is directed to the ministry. Uh, I came across uh, a, a uh, uh, the minister, uh, Dr. Mushelenga, I came up, uh, the Landless People's Movement believes that your ministry is a waste of public resources. Uh, they believe that uh, it should just be a directorate. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't really serve much purpose. That's what they say. What is your response to that? And uh, uh, perhaps uh, the last one is on the media institutions that resort uh, under your ministry. This being uh, NBC, the Namibia Press Agency, uh, and the New Era. There are complaints that these institutions uh, have bloated structures. They are a heavy burden on the taxpayers. As uh, the new minister, what is your plan to ensure that there's prudence and accountability in these institutions and that there they are no overlapping uh, responsibilities or mandates within the three institutions? I thank you. Can you stand there? I just want to take you on, not to take you on, but to check something with you. Uh, the, the question on whether the Minister of Information and Communication Technology deserves a job in that ministry. Is that for him, or should it's, that be for the Prime Minister or somebody else? Uh, the question, I think, he can respond to the question okay. and say, I believe that uh, my ministry needs to exist because of A, B, C, and D. He can respond, he, or is it, should that be in his ambit to answer? He should account. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Minister, you're on the spot. Uh, thank you very much. All ministries are established as the president of the day deem them necessary to perform certain fun functions. For the Ministry of Information and Communication Technology, the president has indicated what are the tasks of the minister and of that ministry when he was introducing government structures he indicated what will be the, this ministry going to do. And looking at the voluminous responsibility of the ministry, starting from information dissemination, coordinating legislation, policies, and overseeing the uh, government information institutions, not only that, and again coming to ICT part, in order to roll out ICT policies and programs and so forth, it obviously deserves to be a ministry on its own, just as it is a practice in some other countries. That's one. Now, coming to the second question was about the media institutions of the government being bloated and so forth. 
uh, for your information, most of these institutions, including the NBC where we are, have on the, for the past years being have the, over the past years cutting down on their staff members. Of course, first you start through the natural process, those that are retiring and those that are resigning, you do not feel in positions. And so is the same with all other media houses, talk of certain times, new era and so forth. It is not that we are not doing that. What was the other question again? Yeah, yeah the one on the general. LPM, LPM, you were talking on LPM. No, that, 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 that one I answered. That what I answered. Yes, I would like to react to the training one. Could more be done? Yes, for sure. But we are a country with limited resources, so just as in any other uh, sort of job that you will be doing in this country, uh, training can only be taken this far, depending on how much resources you have. I know for a fact that the media house that I work for, they do uh, make resources available, yes, and they do upskill the people. I am sure, knowing that uh, the Gwen, the way that I do know her, she would be the same, and, and I'm sure even the others do the same. So, for me, the principle is this. Is the minister entitled to good work? Yes, he is, full stop. Um, Journalism 101, dictates how we will do our work. And we will never, we should never hide behind the fact that training should hold us back in, 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 in bringing quality uh, reports. I mean, it's the basic thing. Uh, when you came out of your house, your mom told, uh, told you to do certain things. You don't always need to, to read the law just to abide by these rules. They're basic upbringing and law. And the same applies for the EFN members. As far as I'm concerned, your quality is what makes you good. And the EFN's guidelines and, and rules of ethics are just there to guide you in case you start wondering whether you're going that little bit too far. But please never hide behind the fact that you're not being uh, uh, trained enough, because then you should not do that job. Uh, Bob, could I just add something briefly on that as well? That I think that's something we haven't really touched on today, is, is, is really looking at the quality of our journalism. And that having been said, I mean, I'd like to emphasize how important it is at this particular juncture in our history that our journalism is unparalleled in terms of its professionalism, its adherence to ethics, and its in terms of quality. The issue around training, I speak as a dinosaur to some extent. Um, I got where I got today without having ever been on a journalist training course in my life. I do think, because they didn't happen in those days in any case, but I think today a lot of our journalists do have access to training. Uh, through the Namibia Media Trust, we often make such training available, also through mentorship. And here I must point fingers directly at the journalists themselves. They often subscribe to these training courses, do not pitch up. Resources are wasted if they don't turn up. Somebody else could have had that place. Um, they either come or they leave after half an hour, whatever, and a lot of them feel they don't need that training and that support. So I would agree with you, Frank. There is a lot of training out there that's available for journalists that they don't always take the opportunity. But again, so much is in their own hands, in their own laps. Journalists should be like sponges, I always say. They should be reading, they should be accessing any kind of information and all information to learn all the time, and I don't see enough of that happening. Too many of the young people that I mentor or train are not even reading. So guys, there's no ways we can deliver quality journalism unless you absolutely going to rise to the challenge of being the best you can be at your craft. Thank you. Uh, just adding to that, I would like to agree, training is necessary, but we must know that training comes to let you improve already where you are. Most of these journalists, they went to journalism school. And when you apply for a job to become a journalist, there are requirements for that job. And you have met, you get the job because you have met the standards yes. and the requirements. So that's one thing that we should take, that we shouldn't take an excuse of training, but already when you come to this job, you are expected to have met some standards. And coming to what Gwen said, supporting to say, they must also put in something. 
I know most of these training programs that are fully funded. Yeah. When people go there, they walk in and out. I will take a particular institution that have a free training program for its employees. They were taken there, they went there, the moment they were told there would be examination at the end, half of the class dropped out, and the money has already been. Yeah. So I would say when training comes, one should also contribute, maybe even 20% of that patient, so that you feel that I need to complete this course because I have put in something so that my money is not wasted. Thank you. Mm. Okay, well, we, we are wrapping up now. This young lady has been standing for the last 10 minutes. I will give uh, the last question from me. Yes, please. Um, uh, my, uh, my name is Merica from NBC. Uh, my question is directed to Honorable Dr. Mushalenga. From NBC. Uh, NBC TV News, yes, everything. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, uh, Doctor, is the government satisfied with media regulating itself, or will it, will it explore more regulations, government regulations? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, what we're going to do is this. We are going to move in to wrap up. The question the minister will take as we wrap up. We shall st start with, um, with uh, the ombudsman. My closing remarks. Yes, please. Yes. My closing remarks would be, and as part of even answering that question, even though it's not directed to me, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights in 2002 issued what is called the principles of press, press freedom in Africa. And I think it's principle 28, if I'm not mistaken, but there it makes very clear, it, the principle is that self-regulation in terms of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights is the way to go. The state should stay out of the business of wanting to control the press, and that basically would be one, of, uh, one way of, of concluding my part and also stressing what everyone seems to be saying, that the time of enacting an access to information uh, legislation or law is way overdue. It's about time that the bill that is sitting, uh, wherever it's sitting at the crafters, uh, legal drafters and whatever, that needs to be finalized and that process needs to be expedited because the people demand or deserve nothing less. That would be my concluding remarks. Thank Frank. you. Frank? Well, obviously, I'm much into this uh, Access to Information Act. I mean, I've been trying to, 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 to do as much as possible from the EFN side to get it passed. And I do urge the minister to please listen to our pleas and, and get this act through as fast as possible, as I pointed out earlier. But my biggest wish today is that all the media in Namibia comes together. EFN should not only be about those people who have elected to become members of EFN. We should all come together so, so that we stand as a unit. And that's very important. We, if we want government to trust us, we need to have trust in ourselves and our own abilities. So those who are not members yet of EFN, on this very day, I would urge you to please make an urgent plan and join us tomorrow at the latest. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll go to Gwen. Thank you, Bob. Um, just to say that that question about government regulation of media, uh, one would have hoped, is a question that has already been relegated to the dustbin of history. Let us not go backwards, please. Um, let us work with self-regulation. Um, our people, like for governments, um, the people are our judges, the judges of the media, whether we're doing right, whether we're doing wrong, whether they choose to listen, to read, to buy our newspapers or whatever. Um, and let us adhere at the same time to quality journalism across the board, adhering to a code of ethics. And maybe we can find a way to more broadly circulate once again the code of ethics uh, for all Namibians to see, not only to help um, the work of the ombudsman and make people aware, but also that code of ethics can be internalized by all of us, from politicians to ordinary mortals to journalists. Um, it tells us what we need to do. I think we do need reminding 
uh, sometimes that we, we are relinquishing our ethics and our morals in this country. And it's not just the media, but it's a lot of other people that could do with reminding of what these ethics are. Finally, I would just say and emphasize that independent, free and independent media is an indispensable pillar of democracy. Um, to people out there, because Afrobarometer findings show and research show that increasingly across Africa, people are losing faith in the media, are losing faith in democracy, are looking more towards authoritarianism. Um, these are very worrying signs. It's an era we came from and that we fought tooth and nail uh, for this democracy. So let's fight to keep it. Part of that is a media. It's a mirror of our society. It speaks truth to power. It holds power to account and is absolutely necessary as far as access to information in the daily lives of citizens are concerned. So please, an appeal to citizens to really be circumspect about what you read and what you unpass online and on your private WhatsApp groups. Please be circumspect. If you can't verify or fact check those things, then go to the media sources which you know are reputable and which will show you what the truth and the facts are. Otherwise, we're spreading disinformation. And as was mentioned earlier, this pandemic is bad enough, but the info uh, demic is even worse. So let's guard against that and please let's protect press freedom, access to information and freedom of expression at all costs. Thank, Thank you. Very you. Much, the Minister. Yeah, with the regard to the last question and just to wrap up, well, uh, we have not, the self-regulation so far in Namibia has not really been bad, but I think more still need to be done on accountability when we correct our errors, we should be sincere and not cynical about it. Uh, secondly, uh, on the point that John raised, when we are talking of control and regulation, we, are, we, we must know we are talking of different things. Legislation are there not to stifle media freedom, but legislations are there to regulate for media freedom in a democratic society. You must remember that government also have a responsibility to protect the public. We are not talking about government, we are talking about the public, innocent people that are there who have been, whose dignity and rights have been violated. We must know that the Constitution talk about the, in, the dignity of any person is inviolable. One, two, we must also know that there are journalists there, junior journalists, who are not happy with the way they are treated by the editors. So when you have <laughs> legislation and regulations, all these things, we are trying to protect everybody, not individuals and so forth. Thank you. But I can guarantee you that government will continue to ensure that media freedom is guaranteed as it is enshrined in the Namibian Constitution. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see. <laughs> protect citizens, not the government. The I'm laws looking, will protect I'm us. I'm looking at all my panelists and it's like the, the meeting is just starting now. <laughs> and, I, and I can see they want an additional half an hour. So th this is how good platforms conclude. Thank you very, very much. I, I also wanted to make a concluding remarks, but I'm under pressure from, from, uh, from my, my, my director. There. Maybe I must take a chance and still go forward. The in South Africa lives a young man who goes by the name Desmond Tutu. Those of you who were born before independence may have heard about him, or those of you who read. Once he went to Robben Island alongside the former apartheid South Africa president, Pierre Bota, they took a boat. It's a real story. They took a boat and went to Robben Island to inspect the press prisoners. At the time, Nelson Mandela, uh, Governor Becky, them were still locked up there. On, of course, everybody had their own experience. It was an emotional experience. When they came back on their way, as they were going back into Cape Town, uh, everybody was locked into their own thinking. And the, the head of PV Bota, he used to wear a white hat, was blown by the breeze into the water. And the, the, the sec state security guys were wondering, should they jump? Should they forget about it? And the story goes that Desmond Tutu stood up, and you know Desmond Tutu is Bishop Tutu, 
uh, with his, you know, he wraps himself into these gowns and he apparently walked over the water, picked up the head, replaced it on the head of the president, and the head, the, the head was not wet. Now everybody was wondering, okay, okay, this man of God, maybe he can transform this whole sea into bottle wines. And, and then they started wondering what will be the headlines in the media tomorrow, Desmond Tutu, man of God, uh, maybe this and the other thing. And guess what were the headlines in the media tomorrow? The, the next day, Desmond Tutu cannot swim. The moral of the story is you cannot predict the media. They have their own way of doing things. So do not be surprised if tomorrow you open, you pick up a copy of Namibian newspaper, and when you look at it, uh, you try to find what the minister said, and you find the story there, Bob Kandetu has grown very old. You must take it as a headline. Thank you very much, and uh, please, uh, we thank you, everybody who have participated, both our sign language interpreters, our OB van, and all of you colleagues from the media. Thank you very much, and here we wrap up. NBC One. It's ours.